Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat malam kepada para partisipan. Di sini sudah ada 140 partisipan ya. Sambil kita menunggu sebentar lagi Profesor Magali akan bergabung, saya ingin mengucapkan selamat datang kepada baik mahasiswa, dosen, dan di sini ada juga staf akademik dari berbagai universitas, ada dari UGM, Unsud, STT Migas, dan juga perwakilan dari Asproditegi. Terima kasih sudah bergabung bersama kami. Tidak ketinggalan juga teman-teman dari Ikatan Alumni ya, Ika Geodita, yang turut bergabung di sini sambil mengembangkan wawasan ya tentunya, yang tentunya bisa diterapkan juga di pekerjaan masing-masing. Seri ini merupakan seri yang ke-6 di webinar seri kita ya, kami. Sedangkan untuk Profesor Magali sendiri kita sudah yang ketiga kali. Dan untuk yang keempat, yang terakhir kali akan diadakan minggu depan. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Oh, hello. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Morning. Yes. My name is Jenny. I will be your moderator for tonight. Excellent. Okay. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, clearly. Okay, thank you. Let me know so, when I should start. Oh, yeah, yeah. I will uh, give a little introduction for you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, good evening to student lecture and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this webinar series organized by Department of Geological Engineering, uh, Universitas Diponegoro. Thank you for joining us uh, and such an honor to have Professor Magali uh, here with us for the third time. Okay, uh, before we start, I would like to give some rules to the participants. Uh, first, uh, we are using Zoom meeting, not Zoom webinar. Hence, we'd like to ask you to mute your sound turn off the camera and refrain from using the annotation so that all we can focus is uh, in the lecture during the presentation. And the Q&A session will be held after the presentation. Participant can write the question under the chat box or we can, or you can ask directly later. And we will share the material And please fill the attendance form using provided a link. And we will share the link at the end of the session, near the end of the session. So please stay with us until the end, okay? Uh, most of us will already was already familiar with Professor Magali because this is the third time she give the lecture in this program. But in case this is your first time, I would like to give a brief introduction. Professor Magali is a research professor at Center for Remote Sensing, Boston University. And she also teaches at several reputable university like Boston University, Tufts University, and Harvard University. Okay. She is a remote sensing geologist specialized in application of remote sensing and GIS in the study of groundwater resources and environmental change of arid and semi-arid lands. She has conducted a long list of research projects, um, mostly in African and Middle Eastern countries, uh, but uh, she is now foreign to Univers Universitas de Bonagoro, I think, because uh, the last three years, uh, she had been in the world class program here, professor program. Uh, not just give lecture, but also conducting research in Indonesia. Okay, that is uh, all I can highlight from your long decades of experience and the faster better. Now, allow me to present our speaker, Professor Magaliko. The time is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, um, good evening. Good morning in my case, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be uh, 
able to participate in this series of uh, talks, seminars. I call them seminars more than, than talks. And uh, I, um, I look forward to your questions. So let me share my screen first and uh, do let me know if uh, you can't um, see it. And uh, let me just minimize a little bit the gallery view. Okay. Okay, so I um, gave um, an overview of um, remote sensing techniques in the very first uh, lecture. I talked a lot about the methodologies and I referred to some of the remote sensing techniques we use in uh, geological mapping. And uh, last time, actually last, last week, I also gave some examples, um, but this, this time, I would like to focus on very specific type of landscape. And this is uh, actually um, volcanic and tectonically active landscape that, um, that I have been also sort of very much interested in, in studying. And, uh, and I think it's an excellent uh, example uh, how remote sensing, how satellite imagery can be used for understanding the, the features on the landscape and so on. And I'm talking about uh, Ethiopia. I have been involved uh, in a couple of studies in Ethiopia. Here you see uh, basically an, an overview of the, um, the Horn of Africa. And in the center, you see Ethiopia. And uh, this is a satellite image. It's showing you the colors this time in, uh, in in natural colors, true colors. So vegetation is green. So the highlands of Ethiopia are shown very clearly on this picture, even though, um, let me uh, use the pointer, just one second. Um, yeah, okay. You see, well, the political boundary, of course, of the country, but uh, you see how the green area very much outlines the highlands, right? And in the middle, there's another piece here. In the middle, or almost in the middle of the country, you see an important tectonic feature. This is the Rift Valley, right? Or at least the part um, that crosses uh, Ethiopia. It continues further south. And uh, it's basically a, 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 a plate boundary, you know, the uh, Nubian or the African plate is moving away from the Somalian plate. And this has caused this incredible canyon-like um, valley. It's a huge valley because uh, Ethiopia is quite a large country. And in the middle, you see that the colors are kind of brown, yellowish, and so on. Very similar to the surrounding, very arid desert-like landscape, right? And this is the, an important depression. It's basically uh, the, the earth crust, crust is, um, is cracked, is fractured, but by many, many parallel uh, striking uh, fault systems. No? And in the middle, so this is a de depressed area. And this is very high, right? Ethiopia, I mean, the, the mountains, they, uh, they may reach up to 4,000 meters uh, elevation. So, and you see <clears throat> some, lighter colored and darker colored patches. These are lakes. And by the way, this is also a very large lake here. And um, so in this um, region, I was invited as a geological, as a you know, a remote sensing geologist to participate in um, archeological um, you know, uh, project in Aksum. Aksum is right here at the border with Eritrea. And the archeologists, uh, they uh, have been studying this uh, region here for, for you know, centuries because there used to be um, an ancient civilization, a kingdom, um, you know, quite important kingdom about uh, almost uh, 2000 years ago. And um, the, um, uh, archaeologists have found many, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, with their excavations, um, you know, uh, many uh, archaeological sites, and they needed to understand better how these ancient people used, you know, their environment to actually, uh, you know, uh, develop such a, uh, an important economic and political power back then, right? It was an important trade route. Um, and so they wanted to know, you know, from where did they, uh, you know, access all the resources, natural resources like building um, materials and, and also how did they, um, you know, um, manage the, the, the water resources and so on. And um, so this is, let me just uh, put the chat back there, okay. So this is why they uh, um, asked us to use remote sensing to actually create a number of maps. They wanted a, a geological map, a soil map. They wanted to understand the hydrology and, and so on. Now this image um, doesn't show very well all the features, landscape features, but it gives you a general picture. So it, in remote sensing, uh, we start usually with uh, an overview of the area to understand main landscape components, right? And then we go and select some features, uh, some images that show features, landscape features in, in more detail, which is shown in the next slide, if I can see. Right. Okay, now it's reacting. So here we're zooming in, but uh, you know, um, um, by you know, uh, really zooming a lot into an area here in the in this uh, rift valley. And this is a picture. It's a it's a photograph actually taken from space by an astronaut. So you have heard about the um, International Space Station. Right, and that's um, basically a platform where astronauts are, you know, conducting a series of experiments in space. But they also are equipped with cameras, very powerful cameras. And so they take, took this picture, and I want to um, you to sort of try to understand what you're looking at. Now, this picture is. Uh, it's true color. So green, what you see green is vegetation, right? And reddish, in reddish color, you see the, the color of the rock, the way we see it usually, you know? And uh, I'm going to trace some features. For example, uh, in general, you see the, the tectonic frame, framework. Uh, you see many parallel linear features. And uh, some of them are very pronounced because they basically um, are highlighted by these very dark, you know, lines. So what, what, what do you think are these lines, dark lines? And what causes those black, you know, uh, yeah, basically uh, black areas? So that's an indication when you look at the, an image that is a two-dimensional the uh, picture of uh, a three-dimensional landscape. When you see these black lines, usually um, they indicate shadow. So these are important fractures, fractured systems, and uh, they uh, highlight a cliff, basically like a you know canyon-like wall, and that cast deep shadows. The sun is probably somewhere here in the east, shining on the surface, and then you have the shadow on the western side of the uh, uh, escarpment. And, uh, but there are also some other interesting features. You can see that there's some, there are some drainage systems here. I don't know if you can see these lines, and they um, kind of are following a perpendicular direction you know, at the right angle. And these drainage features, they are also following fractures. So this is a highly fractured 
piece of the earth crust, basically where the Arabian plate is drifting away, separating from the Somalian uh, plate. And what, um, what's interesting to see here is that vegetation, if you look at the green patches, they tend to follow these, um, the same, you know, uh, the, the same direction of the fractures. And here it's very clear, they follow the drainage systems, right? So vegetation obviously grows where it finds water somewhere, right? And this is a quite arid environment. So if you see vegetation in such an arid environment, you can be sure that uh, these plants are somehow tapping water coming from the ground, so groundwater. So we uh, hydrogeologists, um, we are interested in these fracture systems because we know that they can serve as water conduits. Although this, this, this um, you know, basement rock, crystalline basement rock, um, may be very, um, uh, maybe, um, um, you know, um, may not be perm permeable, but because it's uh, fractured, um, it lets some water through. And also, if you look at uh, these other features here in the center, some of them are dark. These are lakes. And this one is sort of greenish, but it's also a lake with some uh, alg algal bloom. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know that this area is quite arid because the water um, where it's, um, you know, deep enough, it's still there, but when it's um, very shallow, it evaporates and leaves these very uh, bright colored minerals. So these are evaporites, right? But uh, there's another interesting feature on this picture and I'm pointing it out. So anyone has an idea of what this feature might be? So this is a volcano. So it's a basically a remnant of a volcano. So this picture shows a lot of different landscape features. And I want you to um, know that when you get uh, an opportunity to get these uh, slides, um, they're going to be in um, PDF. And what I did is I added some annotations. So if you basically put your cursor on it, you will then um, have a, basically a description of what the what the picture is showing. No? Okay. And I've done that uh, with most of the slides. Let me just um, go back to, okay. So volcanic landforms, uh, they may um, show a lot of variety. So, um, of, uh, as the word says, they're created by volcanism, you know, but uh, um, there are different types of uh, volcanoes and, uh, and also different type of eruptions and, uh, you know, and, uh, and um, volcanic rocks, they basically, um, uh, they, you know, um, deposits uh, after an eruption, they have also different properties and so on and all. And, and, and on these images, satellite images, we can actually identify sometimes the nature of the uh, volcanic, um, um, you know, process, because uh, they will, the rocks will have different type of, you know, not only color, but also texture and so on. No? And they will also form different um, landscapes. No? So the volcanic landforms are associated with the type of volcanic rocks, whether they're highly erosive, whether they're highly, uh, for example, um, also uh, a permeable. So some uh, volcanic landforms you won't see, you will not see a lot of drainage, you know, surface drainage patterns because uh, basically they're extremely um, permeable. So even in uh, humid environments, you know, uh, you may find that, um, you know, the present day precipitation is high, but there, there, there's, you know, very few surface drainage um, features. 
on the landscape. And this is for us uh, hydrologists, uh, hydrogeologists, a very important uh, information because it means that uh, in humid environment, it means that this rain will recharge the aquifer. No? And you will also notice that sometimes the craters do not show any surface water, lakes, sometimes, it depends. No? Uh, and sometimes they are covered by a lake. No? Uh, so that is an indication of how permeable the volcanic material is. No? And uh, the previous picture showed you near vertical fault, fault system, or basically walls, no? causing a shadow effect. No? And that's why it's, they are clearly uh, visible. These are tensional uh, faults because you know, basically the earth crust is breaking there. You know? They're moving apart. So because they're tensional, um, they allow groundwater to flow through it. And that's why you saw some vegetation and also um, some green areas along these fault systems. No? Um, the lakes themselves, they're probably uh, recharged or being fed by groundwater because that part of Ethiopia is very dry. No? However, there are also other um, um, uh, types of faults that are not, not uh, serving as water or groundwater conduits, but they're filled with lava. So those are also uh, basically um, tensional faults, but they're not being uh, intruded. They're being intruded by lava instead of uh, groundwater. And they can be also detected on these satellite images because when you see um, the um, volcanic plaques that uh, basically follow uh, linear, uh, you know, direction. Can, you can be, uh, you can assume that these are um, uh, lava extrusions, and uh, we will see that in the next slide. Just want to mention here that these different lava flows they have different characteristics, and they can be uh, distinguished also on images by their freshness, how young they are. You know, you can actually uh, see as um, sort of interpret uh, the, the sequence of events, of lava flow events, and also the viscosity is sometimes um, can be inferred from these images because of the roughness, the surface roughness or smoothness, okay? So this is um, more or less um, shown in this picture here. And here again, we're looking at the Rift Valley, this time in Kenya. Okay, so that's the continuation from uh, Ethiopia down to uh, Kenya. And we see on this picture, uh, basically uh, no surface drainage. The previous one, we, we saw some water, right? And lakes and, and the vegetation, which is an indication for, uh, for water, for, for groundwater. But here there, you know, there's basically very little um, drainage at all. However, we, we do see very clearly these very long linear features and casting very deep uh, shadows. You know? And not only that, so these are uh, rift faults, these very long you know, uh, linear features. But not only that, we see some uh, circular features, right? These are all volcanoes, but different types of uh, volcanoes. You know? And then we see some dark, you know, um, darkened areas and different gray tones. So this is, you know, a different gray from that one. And this looks also a little bit different from this one and, 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 and so on. And here, I don't know if you can see that on the picture, but um, there are some um, basically um, uh, features that are uh, sticking out, right? These are volcanic plugs and they sort of are aligned along a line. So this is what I was referring to that uh, these lava plugs may be an indication of some fault systems that were filled with uh, lava. And then the land surface, uh, you know, when it um, got eroded, these um, more weather, uh, weathering uh, resistant rocks they uh, stick out like 
like plaques. That's why we call them plaques, okay? Another interesting feature, well, there are many interesting features in, uh, visible in this uh, picture here, uh, is that some of these faults, very long fault systems, which are, you know, uh, very uh, old uh, fracture systems, um, they cut through these volcanoes, which are obviously younger, right? So volcano number one is definitely younger than these uh, rift fault systems. But what happened here is that um, these fault systems were reactivated, okay? And uh, so that's why they cut through a younger, um, you know, um, geological um, formation. In this case, it's the, uh, the uh, young uh, crater. There are some other uh, craters here, number two, and you can also see some reactivated faults, linear features here. Another interesting observation is the, the lava flow, um, basically, in the, you know, covering large areas. And uh, we can actually, um, from this um, picture, uh, see which one is younger and which one is older. You see that the annotation says that the darker one is younger and the lighter one is older. And oftentimes, um, um, when you go to the field, of course, you see that one is on top of the other, but uh, oftentimes we can identify the uh, age of the uh, lava flow by um, uh, looking at the relationship with other structures. For example, here, number two, there's a volcano and we can clearly see the perimeter of the volcano, right? And what we see is that the lava flow, the older one, sort of, you know, um, follows that, uh, that um, perimeter. It doesn't cover the, um, um, uh, so basically it stops at the rim. It goes around the rim, you know? So um, the different lava flows can be detected by their color and also surface texture. I don't know if you see that the texture changes. That can be an indication of different level of um, viscosity. But um, for example, in this case, the lava flows abutes, basically it stops against the wall of this crater. crater. And probably the uh, pyroclastic deposits of this crater uh, or volcano is under the older lava, okay? So, um, so this is definitely the, the older lava is uh, older than the volcano. So we can see the stratigraphic uh, sequence by interpreting uh, these features, whether fractures, you know, uh, dissecting a, a, a volcano crater or not, or a, old, or a lava flow uputing uh, basically uh, along the rim of a, of a volcano. You know? Now, we have in remote sensing many types of images, optical as well as radar. And this is an example of a radar image showing also a volcanic landscape. But in this case, the, uh, the radar is picking up all kinds of uh, uh, surface roughness. And, uh, and uh, for the untrained eye, sometimes it's very hard to see, identify anything. It's different from the optical uh, images. But um, if you look closely here, there is a crater, right? And there, there's a larger one. So this is a caldera. And it, uh, it only the, the Western part is still, uh, you know, topographically <laughs> preserved. The Eastern and Northern part, they're basically eroded away. Here there is a, a landslide. Um, so it's harder to interpret these images because of the nature, the, the radar um, uh, the images are, um, you know, um, they depict the, the, the landscape uh, in a different uh, way than, for example, um, optical. They are very sensitive to height differences and they uh, 
enhance those very much. Here we do have drainage and we have radial drainage no? so around the, uh, the crater. Um, by the way, this is an example that I found from uh, uh, you know, a volcano in uh, West Java, uh, north of uh, Bandung. And um, the arrows here, they help you to sort of um, see, hopefully you can see it, uh, lineaments. So they're kind of hard to interpret these lineaments because you've got lineaments and also drainage um, patterns. And, um, and then you've got uh, some, uh, um, you know, um, the, the radar uh, is um, um, also showing some uh, terrain distortion. So it's hard to see, but uh, uh, maybe this one is more pronounced. No? This is just to show you that um, uh, we use different types of images to um, interpret the landscape. And here, what's really clear is that within the caldera, we have a, a younger volcano and the rim structure is, uh, is uh, clearly visible. All right. So with this um, sort of introduction into how to interpret volcanic land, scapes or landforms using optical images as well as radar. I want to show you some slides from my own research in Ethiopia. I mentioned that Aksu, uh, which uh, lies in the Tigray highlands of northern Ethiopia near Eritrea, uh, was a very important political, cultural and commercial uh, center um, in the first millennium AD. You know? and, um, Today it's a, it's a, it's a town, um, but back then, uh, um, you know, it um, was a very uh, important post, um, you know, uh, and, uh, and many commercial routes, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, roads uh, would uh, cross this uh, part of Ethiopia, connecting basically the, the Red Sea with uh, the Nile and, 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 and so on. Today, it's, um, it's an environmentally degraded region, uh, you know, with climate change and all that. Uh, although it's in the highland, uh, they have uh, very pronounced uh, dry, uh, dry seasons or drought is a problem and, um, and erosion. And, um, and but, uh, you know, um, still humans have learned to adapt to this environment. And we wanted to um, sort of uh, understand better the natural resources that not only ancient people, uh, you know, um, used, but also present day and how their, the people have adapted to these uh, climate changes. So again, um, uh, we're now looking at this um, area here and this is um, uh, sort of a topographic uh, map uh, showing you the, um, the, the, the main uh, volcanic uh, hills. You can see here the contour lines, they sort of uh, outline these very round structures. These are volcanic plaques, right? And uh, the town of Aksum is right here and all these dots indicate where archaeologists found some traces of, uh, uh, you know, previous human um, civilizations. And then some um, um, samples, soil samples that were collected. So what they found in the field is um, ancient tracks, basically roads, right? Um, they, um, archaeologists, they, they know how to distinguish a, a, a present day road from an ancient road. So uh, I'm not an archaeologist, but uh, somehow they find some indication that this road has been used for thousands of years. Um, and, uh, and then they, um, uh, I guess they find some uh, remnants of pottery or something, you know, that indicates that uh, this was an important uh, Road. They also found uh, quarries because the ancient people they built their you know temples and so on and they needed the building materials and the building materials 
so you, that, that, that they use were basically those, um, you know, volcanic rocks they found. And this is um, uh, one of the quarries and you can see that they were trying to detach very, uh, basically uh, a piece of the rock and, uh, and, uh, and use that for building their monuments. And they also found some wine presses where they would, you know, uh, make wine. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and also they, the ancient people knew how to, um, how to store rainwater and groundwater, especially during the dry season. No, they built basically these water reservoirs, no? and they used terracing technique to cope with the erosion, which is uh, quite uh, severe, because they used the land for agriculture. So we were asked um, to come up with a technique to um, to map the uh, the main lithological uh, units, because the uh, official geological map was not. Uh, detailed enough for the archaeologists. Archaeologists, they need very detailed information, right? And the official logical map uh, was just too coarse. The, the scale was too coarse. So we used a sensor called Aster. Aster, by the way, is available, freely available. And you can, you know, search for it and download uh, the data and, and, and process it. Um, so the, the previous uh, topographic map I showed you before showed you the contours of these plugs. And here we see a false color image. In red, we see vegetated areas. And this is Aksum, the, the town. Now it's a small city. And here you have to scale, right? And then you see that the surrounding these uh, volcanic plugs are some darker areas. This is flood basalt, right? And it's also the reason why this region is so fertile. The soil is very fertile. So because they needed um, uh, you know, detailed information, we, uh, we obtained um, an Econos image, a high, very high resolution image, which is this one here of this uh, study area. And we also uh, generated a digital elevation model, a DM from the, um, from the topographic map. Okay, so we use the DM, the digital elevation model, uh, to visualize the very high resolution image in three dimension. And here you can clearly see this um, Pieta Georgis uh, hill or plaque, you know, volcanic plaque. It's eroded, the top is eroded, and surrounding the rim is uh, uh, basically a forested area which looks dark. But the, the top is, is flat and is being used for agriculture, you know, as well as the surrounding areas. You know? And you see some water reservoirs. Here's a water reservoir. And then you see some lighter colored areas. This is a different type of um, volcanic rock, uh, highly um, you know, weathered. And uh, the white color comes from the clay that you know, it's uh, the weathering product. And the clay um, minerals, they are highly reflectant. And the darker color is uh, basically the, the, the basalt, the uh, flood basalt. You know? And very uh, clearly, you can see the drainage system. You know? And here, a close up actually, I should have uh, <laughs> explained all this using the close up, which is much easier to see. You know? So, um, they found that uh, the ancient uh, um, people, they, depending on you know, the period, um, there was a period when they occupied the top of the hill and then later on they occupied uh, you know, the surrounding areas. And um, so archeologists believe that uh, depending on um, you know, where they could access more easily natural resources, meaning fertile soil, water, building, um, you know, uh, uh, material like stones and so on, they would then move to uh, be closer to those uh, resources. So the, geologically speaking, the area is composed of two main lithologic uh, units, you know, of tertiary age. 
So you got the stratified flood basalt, uh, and they basically cover this gently undulating plateau surface, which we saw here. This is the plateau surface, you know. So it's kind of not completely flat. You know, there are some hills, you know. So this is more or less covered by this uh, Kojetsa volcanics, um, uh, you know, sequence of uh, flood basalt. Um, and then um, they, uh, this, this plateau area is, is intruded by uh, these uh, volcanic necks or, or pl uh, plugs, and they are, or they contain um, trachyte, you know? And so they are trachytic, um, so very uh, fine grained uh, and light colored uh, volcanic uh, rocks. And these plugs, they stand out as circular hills, you no? Know? Due to the fact that the rock composition is is different from the surrounding flood basalt, you know, and they're more resistant, although the top of uh, Bieta Georgis is eroded, and that's why it's flat. You know. And so, large part of this highland Tigray, the highland, is covered by a very thick layer of tertiary basalt, you not know, flood basalt, and that's the reason why the soil is so rich in nutrients and so on, right? Um, but beneath that the basalt, you will find a sequence of Paleozoic and Mesozoic sedimentary rocks no? that uh, overlay unconformably uh, the Precambrian basement rocks. And that's shown here. So under the flood basalt, which would be somewhere you know, up here, you find these Mesozoic, Paleozoic uh, rock sequence. And, uh, and you can see uh, the layering very clearly, right? But you also see um, the reddish, you know, color indicates that, um, you know, they're high in, in iron oxide and so on. And quite erosive because the whole slope here is highly erosive, but the people that live here, and you can see here the, the different, uh, you know, uh, um, houses or huts and so on, or the farmers, uh, and rangers where they live, um, they adapted to this, um, this environment and also to the climate. As I said, they have very pronounced rainy season and dry season, right? And they, they uh, controlled the, uh, the erosion by building this uh, terracing system, you know, and to use basically the slope also for agriculture. But not only that, they, uh, and that's since ancient time, that's what the archeologists say, you know, I mean, for the last 2000 years, um, they also um, learned how to build these reservoirs, water reservoirs, no? So this, these are man-made, man-built, um, you know, with no mechanical um, um, means, um, uh, dams, right? So they basically excavated here some soil and you can see still the trenches and then built this dam here you know, so that they have enough water also during the, the dry season. But in general, the landscape uh, looks very dark, the soil. And uh, it's a semi-arid environment nowadays. You know? it, uh, the climate was uh, slightly different 2000 years or 1000 years ago, but uh, still they had, um, cope with the, the droughts and they learned how to do that. You know? So in this type of uh, subhumid or semi-arid climate, uh, these soils, basalt rich soils, they're called vertisoils. Okay. And um, I don't know um, if you are familiar with this type of soil, but I can tell you from my own experience, I have been there during the dry season and during the rainy season. So these are very black, um, yeah, cotton-like soils. And um, so the surface is very uneven. And when you try to walk over these wet, dirty soils, you, your, your boots, because usually you wear boots there, uh, will sink <laughs> into the soil, right? And then, and it's very hard to, to walk over these, um, Vertisols, and you and you notice that your boots or your shoes or whatever you're wearing, uh, field um, shoes, or boots, um, the sole will basically um, 
um, you know, have a, a, a layer of, of the soil. So <laughs> your foods become very heavy, right? And this is because these um, soils, they're, they contain uh, laterites and bauxites and, uh, and um, the, um, 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 when, when, uh, when there's enough uh, moisture, uh, the, the soil will swell, right? Because it contains a lot of clay minerals, and um, and during the dry season, it uh, basically the opposite uh, happens, and uh, it builds the, the soil surface will show many cracks, right? Um, so uh, during the when the the rains come back, the rainwater will basically infiltrate the soil through these cracks, you know. Um, and make and then the clay minerals will swell and make the soil impermeable. So what's found in, in Ethiopia over these uh, very large um, regions covered by the flood basalt is that during the rainy season, the the rainwater will just stay on top of the, the land surface. It's amazing. So it builds a huge water lamina, you know? and I've seen that actually. Um, uh, on the ground. So, um, uh, as I say, they, they, the, the people there have to cope with these two um, seasons. So either the landscape or the surface is completely covered by water because the, you know, uh, water cannot uh, infiltrate the ground, the, the soil, or during the uh, dry season, they have to cope with the fact that uh, there's a lot of erosion happening, you know? and so farmers they uh, need to learn how to um, deal with that. Uh, you also find a lot um, of areas that are eroded, uh, causing piping gullies. You know? These are like uh, uh, sometimes canyon-like cracks in the surface, in the flood basalt surface. So the geomorphology of flood basalt terrain, you know, consists of several structural levels or terraces. And the structural levels, they reflect the differences in resistance to uh, denudation or erosion of the vesicular and massive basalt. And let's uh, look at some of these um, um, areas that we visited and where also um, soil scientists took a, you know, a, a profile a detailed profile of the sequence of different uh, soil layers. And they um, are very important for us um, remote sensing geologists because the, the images, what they show is basically the top surface of whatever is um, you know, on the land surface. And we need to understand the relationship between the soil, the soil profiles and the parent rock. Because if we wanna Mm, create the geological map, you know, the images are not showing us always the, the rock outcrops. And uh, oftentimes, you know, it's also, uh, you know, the surface is vegetated. So we see a combination of vegetation, floyd, and with all this information, somehow we need to um, establish or we need to find out what is the parent rock, right? What is the, <laughs> what's the lithology under? The vegetation under the soil and these soil profiles they can be very very thick so here we got like two meters right um so uh, understanding the the soils and how soils are uh, formed from the parent rock is very important in order to help interpret these images you know? so we visited with the archaeologists and with the soil scientists many of these sites and of course we uh, 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 we picked some sites uh, near a stream because you get a very nice profile, no? Uh, and uh, you can see how thick the soil is, no? And here's another example. So uh, in the back, you actually see one of these uh, volcanic plugs, the one that I was showing you before on the high resolution image. And then we are standing on this flood basalt uh, you know, plateau area. And uh, of course, finding here outcrops uh, is only possible if you go into one of these um, valleys or, you know, um, eroded um, um, 
uh, drainage channels. You know? And here are some other pictures just to show you the nature of uh, this uh, landscape. You know? It's very important to visit the study area and take pictures. It will help you to interpret satellite images. You know? um, and here you can see clearly uh, the, uh, these are fields. So it's obviously not during the, um, the growing season. So these fields have already been harvested. So this is the dry season. You know? uh, we, we tend to go to the, during the dry season because it's much easier to walk. <laughs> As I said, uh, it's almost impossible to cross these fields during the wet season. I mean, you, you get, uh, you know, um, trapped by the, <laughs> by these uh, vertisoils. All right, so with um, together with the, the field survey and the satellite images and also the topographic map. So we took the topographic map and um, used the contours, the contour lines um, in, a, you know, in a GIS system to um, actually map the drainage system. You know? And uh, so this would be, um, a high resolution image, Econos image. Um, and here we see the seasonal rivers because not they don't uh, you know um, carry water uh, year round, only during the, the rainy season. You know? um, and then uh, we also mapped, uh, not shown here, but we mapped the fractures, fracture system. Some of these drainage channels, they follow fractures. And in this type of terrain, fractures are very hard to, sometimes very hard to, to identify because they are covered by a thick soil, making it very hard to <laughs> see any fractures, right? So it, veget vegetation is not the only problem here. The main problem here is soil. Um, and then the archeologists, uh, well, they have their way to uh, identify uh, traditional tracks. You know, they know uh, where ancient people tend to um, travel and, uh, and cross the landscape. And then, of course, they recorded many archaeological sites and they dated them because these archaeological sites, they're not representative of one period. You know? So, and, uh, and they know the sequence of uh, migration, settlement migration, and they wanted to know how come that people, you know, uh, migrated from one place to the other. And usually it has to do with the uh, resources. So we generated this uh, classified image from the, the uh, Econos satellite, which represents different soil map units. Soil, because you know the rocks are really not outcropping there. Um, so we ran the remote sensing analysis uh, it's a basically a combination of geologic and pedologic uh, mapping. Pedologic stands for soil. And um, so we had two field seasons, no? and that was extremely important also, not only for observation, but also we took samples, soil samples, and we took them back to the lab, to our lab. And we, uh, I will show you uh, some picture later, we, in the lab, we took some spectral, um, you know, uh, uh, measurements of these soil maps because we wanted to understand the mineral composition of the soil to understand what's under the soil, basically the parent rock. And uh, so we um, uh, used the combination of uh, high resolution Econos and Aster. Aster is not high resolution, but it has many spectral bands. It actually has more spectral bands than Econos. So although the spatial resolution is less good, less you know, detailed than Econos, it has more spectral information. And that's very critical for mapping rocks and soils. No? So we collected the soil samples for laboratory analysis. We also conducted some uh, mineralogical, mineralogical analysis to know decomposition. And um, we also used, um, you know, uh, a DM you know, that was created from a topographic map for terrain analysis. And so uh, the objective was to establish a relationship between the, the, the landscape, the environmental setting, and the 
archaeological site distribution. No? So here, again, a true color image. And you can see that this area is a uh, forest. It's actually replanted. You know, they, they're trying to cope um, with the erosion by planting the rim of the plots, the volcanic plots, you know, the surrounding area, and then using the flat top, top area for agriculture. But this is basically to prevent erosion, you know, more or less. Um, now, vegetation, of course, is a problem for for uh, mapping the logical uh, features because it doesn't, uh, you know, <laughs> it impedes basically seeing what's under the trees, right? Uh, so we use the mask to eliminate that area from our mapping effort. But here we concentrated on the soil and tried to establish the relationship between the soil type and the rock type. So what we did is we went to the field and we collected many, many points, uh, measurements, uh, you know, photographs, uh, soil samples, uh, you know, uh, basically we built a database you know, with uh, very um, detailed information. And sometimes we would go along a, a, a stream and look at the um, outcropping rocks. Sometimes you, you see them there you know, and, and record that. So this is a panchromatic image of the corners. The, um, Spatial resolution is one meter, one meter pixel size. And with these samples um, that we analyzed, uh, you know, in, in the lab, and also we used the spectrometer in the lab to, uh, to obtain the spectral signature. So the very detailed, you know, um, curves are soil um, uh, spectral, um, you know, uh, um, curves and the sort of uh, you know less detailed curves right are from the image so we got spectral curves indicating how much reflectance happens along the different wavelength regions okay from visible light to near infrared to short wave infrared and so when it, uh, you know, when um, the soil sample, or the point basically indicates that, uh, you know, the, the curve was obtained from Aster, it means that we extracted that um, spectral signature from the Aster image. And then we compared that with the same point that we visited, you know, in the field and took uh, a sample, took it to the lab and then measure the spectral reflectance pattern of that soil sample. And we can see that the curves, they do match quite well you know, in general. They miss some absorption features or, or some uh, reflection features because the, the Aster image doesn't have so many spectral bands. So, but more or less they follow um, a similar uh, shape. And here, just to show you how it works. So in the field, with the GPS, we took a reading of our location. We took pictures, we took a sample, we took it to the lab, we analyzed it. We know exactly the, um, you know, the mineral contact, the texture, the color, the organic um, material, pH, well, all kinds of things you know, that you obtain from the soil. We know the mineralogy, right? Um, and, and since we know where these, samples were collected, we go to the picture, to the image, and we extract a spectral curve, which is in red from the, the image, and, and then compare it to the laboratory uh, spectrum. You know? And this is um, important because if we wanna run a classification, and that's what the, the purpose is of this uh, exercise, is to run um, you know, um, an image classification to identify uh, different um, uh, units, soil units, and then hopefully establish the relationship between the soil and the, and the parent material. This is why the mineralogy of the soil is so critical for us to understand, you know, what's the parent rock that basically was used to form the soil, what's under the soil, you know? And we did the same also with um, Econos. This is a uh, classification output, you know? um, and uh, you see the different colors here 
um, different types of uh, soils. Uh, vegetation is black because it was uh, masked out. So we can't see the soil under you know, the forest. Um, and the different colors indicate, uh, you know, um, the, uh, whether a soil is, uh, you know, compact, eroded, or whether it's uh, basically uh, composed of uh, soil with rock fragments, you know, um, and the darker soils where they are, and so on. And as I said, Aster has a lower spatial resolution. You can see that clearly because this, 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 plug here and this one here, these two are, this one is the main and this one is the other one. And uh, you can see many uh, different uh, uh, volcanic plugs. I mean, it's all, they're all over. But uh, the fact that the um, aster has more spectral bands allows us to distinguish different landscape uh, land uh, uh, cover types by their color. You see clearly that the dark color, the very dark color, that's the flood basalt, right? And the very light one, this, this light is basically what I just showed you in the previous picture. That's why I was showing you so many, uh, let me see if I can do this, okay. That's why I was showing you some uh, pictures. It's that, this, this material here, now here's the plateau, and then you have the slope. The uh, basically um, Mesozoic, Paleozoic uh, sediments, they're shown here. This uh, reddish, whitish colored area. You know? So it's very critical to go to the field and understand what you're looking at when you interpret an image. Otherwise, it's, you know, the colors will not tell you anything. They are meaningless. Um, now, you see these, all these letters here, I, L, K, and D, and whatever, no? These are the different units that we were, basically, uh, rock units and soil units we were able to distinguish from, from Aster. No? And red, by the way, the very red areas, like here, um, they indicate the... Um, uh, vegetation. So this is an image from the dry season. So, you know, uh, the fields ha have been harvested, so there's not much crop uh, growing, but along the drainage systems, you see um, vegetation and also the, the forested uh, part of the, uh, the hills. And uh, based on the spectral uh, information uh, obtained from the aster, and also compared to the spectral uh, soil um, uh, curves that we obtained uh, uh, from the lab, we were able to carry out uh, what we call a supervised classification. So we knew for each of these uh, classes, the spectral signature, you know, because we, we went to the field, we took pictures, we observed, you know, uh, the area, we took samples, we analyzed them. So we knew exactly where, you know, uh, in our image are sites that we visited and where we know exactly the identity of that uh, area. And we use that to train the algorithm and run a supervised classification. And um, the algorithm then basically looks for similar um, uh, pixel, uh, you know, uh, values. And, uh, and, and groups them into, you know, each color will show uh, areas that uh, look spectrally very similar. You know? And here we can start actually um, um, mapping or analyzing the area or interpreting the area with respect to uh, lithologic units. So here you see that the um, in comparison to the Econos classification, we're no longer talking about uh, soils, we're talking about uh, mythology. And that's only possible because we did all the lab work, right? Um, so in green, maybe uh, basically in green tones, you see the basaltic soils. And then in uh, sort of, um, um, you know, in, um, these colors here, 
um, there's there, there there are some areas where it was where, where it was not possible to identify the lithology. So we used um, you know um, determined the, them according to their uh, soil types. And here a comparison between these two sensors. So Aster, low spatial resolution but high spectral resolution, and Iconos high spatial resolution, but low spectral resolution. You know? And the colors are not, um, they don't match. So don't uh, try to match the colors. The legend will tell you how we interpreted the Aster image. And, and this one will tell you how we interpreted the Econos image. You know? And you will see that the legend, the key uh, is different. You know? So each satellite image or sensor uh, depending on its characteristics, you know, how many spectral bands and spatial resolution and so on, will, um, will, be, um, uh, will provide um, maybe different um, aspects or, or different types of information about the land cover, right? So they are related, right? But they may not be identical. Right, um, but they are complementary um, uh, information. So here we are mostly describing the nature of the soil, and here we're trying to establish the lithology. And uh, finally, here uh, let me see how much time I have because I wanted to give a demo. Um, the uh, some of the GIS analysis you can do once you have the soil map. You can drape it over the DEM. So vegetation was masked out. So that's why you see it uh, dark, uh, black. And uh, you can clearly see that certain colors, um, they seem to follow, um, you know, the flat uh, lowlands and other colors um, may be found along the flanks of these hills. Okay, uh, I want to uh, just quickly um, um, give you a demo of uh, one of the um, uh, satellite data archive uh, uh, portals that exist. And um, so many space agencies are making an effort to, you know, um, basically um, uh, visualize and, and make uh, the data accessible to the, to, to, um, to the users through their portals or geo portals. You know? And NASA, like many other agencies, uh, they, uh, satellite data providers, they uh, came up with a, a, a tool called the Worldview. And so if you go and click on this link, you, it will take you to a data visualization and also download tool. Because usually um, a user wants to first search for the data and see, you know, whether it's um, the data is useful for their application. You know, because downloading data may take a long time, and sometimes you know you end up downloading data that you find is not really useful for your application. So this is why they, um, uh, the data providers uh, or the space agency lets the user first visualize the, uh, the satellite images before downloading, just to you know, uh, see whether that's what, what you're really looking for. You know? So Worldview provides you the ability to interactively browse global full resolution satellite imagery, download uh, the image, you know, if you want. And uh, it has a, a, a growing collection of images, but also it has, uh, um, it also um, lets you search and download uh, uh, processed uh, satellite images. You know? Now, um, don't expect to find in this uh, freely available, publicly available website, very high resolution images. Because with very high resolution images like Econos, um, the, the thing is that, that they are not freely available. 
they are they come from commercial satellites so they will not be uh, listed here okay and before i give you the demo just uh, wanted to um, let you know that these slides are here for you later when you explore the uh, the site to learn how these um, uh, different um, functions here allow you to navigate through this uh, uh, data archive system and how to display images and so on. No? So here you've got, I, I will give you a demo, but here you've got some basic instructions. No? And it uh, always, um, uh, uh, when you first uh, go into this um, uh, website, it shows you, um, um, actually it shows you uh, uh, MODIS images, several images. Uh, that um, MODIS is a sensor on top of a satellite that flies from north to south along this path, right? And it shows you actually several orbital paths of this uh, sensor. So right now, uh, well, not right now, <laughs> last year, September 18, 2019, when I took this um, snapshot, the satellite was right in that very moment was actually scanning this, this area here. So it, it hasn't um, had enough time, you know, to scan the adjacent uh, region. And uh, these orbital paths of the satellite, sometimes they do not um, overlap completely along the, the equator. And that's why you see these uh, gaps, data gaps. You, know? um, you see the continents, this is uh, South America and here North America. And you see, of course, a lot of clouds and the oceans and so on. No? So um, there's a timeline down here. And the timeline allows you to go back in time and see what the satellite was um, capturing, maybe a day before or a few years earlier and so on. No? And it uses more or less uh, like a, a GIS, um, um, yeah, sort of uh, uh, layer uh, layer uh, system. You know? uh, right now, uh, as I said, MODIS uh, is the sensor, Terra is the satellite, is being shown. And, but there are some other uh, layers, for example, the coastline, they're hard to see. And uh, you can, you know, drag these layers and put one on top of the other and so on. And you can also add layers, right? Additional layers. And when you click on add layers, it will open this, um, this dialog box here. And it, um, this is a, like a search um, engine. You, know, you can search for specific data. And uh, satellite data is, um, is archived or is cataloged according to uh, disciplines or according to um, you know, um, topics hazards and disaster, and you can search for it. For example, if you're interested in droughts, uh, you may wanna click on the drought category and it will uh, show you a list of different, uh, either satellite images or also vector uh, data um, related to drought and so on, okay? And you can also search according to the science disciplines if you're interested in the biosphere, you know, in forested areas, mangroves, or if you're interested in, uh, you know, in the land surface or terrestrial hydrosphere, um, name it. No, so you you can do the same search, but using these discipline categories. And once you uh, found what you were looking for, in this case, I was looking for soil moisture, right? It allows you to select a number of products, and these are already processed products. And they were derived from satellite images together with um, model outputs. You know? um, so as you can see here, let me just uh, get the pointer back. You see here under soil moisture, it will list a number of different sensors and model, model outputs, and then on the left side, I have the different sensors and models. And here, there's one sensor called SMAP, uh, soil 
map uh, or soil, what is it? Mapping, I, I forgot the name of, uh, of that um, uh, sensor. Uh, and uh, next to it, it says model added, model value added. So it's basically uh, uh, what we call a higher level uh, satellite data product. No? All right, someone needs to mute, mute their mic. Okay, good. Um, yes, and this is the, the output, the soil moisture, you know, model output. And the different colors are uh, indicate the soil moisture. Now the the spatial resolution is not very high. It's nine kilometers. So each pixel has covers an area of nine by nine kilometers. However, uh, although it's very coarse, it's still very appropriate for um, global studies. No? And, um, and you can see that the legend indicates that these are uh, physical uh, quantities. It's giving you you know, the, uh, I think the uh, surface soil moisture uh, in cubic, uh, you know, uh, cubic meter uh, over cubic meters, you know. Um, I think it's the root soil moisture of the, probably the upper um, layer of the soil. Um, what's important is to know here is although the spatial resolution is not very high, nine by nine kilometers, the temporal resolution is very high. You get this product basically every um, certain hours. So per day, several times. And for those who study soil moisture, for example, hydrogeologists, that's very important to have that temporal resolution. More important sometimes than the spatial resolution. And as you can see, in South America, the Amazon basin shows high moisture content. You know? Whereas here in, in Northern Africa, where you have the desert area, low, very low, uh, you know, moisture content. And here, sorry that uh, Indonesia is kind of uh, cut off. Uh, you 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 can zoom in a little bit and and look at that. You know? on this this graph here is a summary of um, the different um, tools that you got no? and uh, the explanation. So feel free to sort of uh, um, you know, use this website and, and here you have some uh, explanation on how to use it, right? So now I'm hoping I can give you a, a quick demo. Let me see how much time I have. I, I think I have 10 minutes, is that right? I hope so. 12 minutes. Oh, 12 minutes. Oh, yeah. Yes. More than, yeah, okay. So let me whoop, go. Okay. I, I prepared the. Um, yeah. So when you click on this uh, worldview uh, uh, link, the first thing you will see is a welcome, uh, you know, uh, box or dialogue box. No. And I encourage you to sort of visit these examples. You know. Um, I'm going to pick one, um, and uh, I hope I can go back to that in a minute. And this, this is a, a volcanic uh, eruption that happened in Indonesia in February 2018. So for now, let me just uh, remove that. And uh, so now we're uh, looking at the... Um, um, at the, the MODIS uh, sensor collecting, you know, uh, information, uh, taking, you know, uh, scanning over the earth. And uh, so it's October 8, right? And you can see that right now it just crossed um, uh, Africa. So it hasn't been able to take a picture yet today of, um, you know, America or South America and North America, but it will in a few hours. And this website is being updated every three hours. Um, so here we could uh, go and uh, click on add layers and you would then, um, you know, see the different um, 
um, ways of searching for data. You can also just type something here. And, um, and uh, it, you know, these categories help you to sort of narrow down your search. Um, uh, if you're interested, let's say, in land surfaces, apparently there are 266 um, different uh, satellite data products, no? And everything is global. Everything, uh, all these um, layers of, of satellite um, images, they, they cover the entire world. Um, that doesn't mean that the, the, uh, the, uh, the Earth surface is being imaged um, as a whole. So as you could see, the satellite has to follow its orbit and it takes time for it to you know, trace its orbit around the Earth and take pictures. And then the, the agency, the space agency will stitch together these images and produce this map. So this map that you see here is the result of many orbits many, many, many orbits that the sensor was, um, the satellite was uh, tracing around the Earth. And then they combined everything to create one picture covering the entire globe. And this uh, requires time, but um, because this is a particular sensor, uh, uh, you know, can cover the entire globe within, you know, I think a day or so, they are able to generate these uh, composite images uh, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So you can do a search here. Um, for now, I wanna uh, just uh, show you some other features. Um, as I said, uh, you can, um, you know, put some place names or not, uh, move them around and so on. Uh, there's another interesting, um, um, feature here, which is called events. And I'm going to, for now, uh, uh, maybe the place names, and okay, I'll leave them. And there's another feature here uh, where you can download data. But before you download data, you need to know more about your data. So events is um, uh, a feature that allows you to look for specific disaster events. And uh, they're listed here according to the date. So the latest one is a wildfire in New Zealand you know, a few days ago. They're not, not all catastrophic events are listed here. They, they basically make a selection, but uh, some of them. And um, if you're looking for volcanic uh, events, so the, the symbols will indicate whether it's a wildfire, a tropical uh, storm, uh, sometimes also what else do they have? A lot of wildfires because we really have a big problem with wildfires worldwide. It's uh, really amazing. I'm trying to find some uh, some volcanoes. Okay, here it comes. So there are also some other events like uh, volcanoes and icebergs and so on. And you got um, looking for one specific. It's no longer there. Well, this one is from, um, yeah, this one is from Indonesia. I was looking for, I don't know if this one will, um, uh, they keep changing it. I was looking for something else. Let me see, 18. Well, yeah, let me pick one of them just to show you that um, um, when you click on this one, it will take you to the side, right? And uh, well, uh, at least we are in, in Java, that's good. <laughs> and you can zoom in if you want. And not only it takes you to the side, but it also takes you to the time when obviously that volcano was erupting. You know? And sometimes, um, there's not, uh, I was looking for some additional information. That's another one. Okay. Where's that? Okay, okay, here it is. 
All right. Uh, there's another one. Let me zoom in. I think this is the one I was looking for. Good. Um, and you see, uh, well, uh, the day it erupted, it was very cloudy. So it's kind of hard to see anything, right? Um, but then you, these, um, these selected, uh, you know, events, uh, they have uh, uh, basically a link that will take you to another side, which will provide you some information about this particular volcanic eruption. No? First of all, it gives you a, a picture, you know, location and so on. And then it um, uh, also uh, gives you some description. No? And I was looking for this here. And um, not only that, uh, it also lists some uh, satellite images of higher resolution, in this case, Sentinel-2, and especially the thermal uh, you know, uh, band um, that indicates the hotspot at the um, you know volcanic uh, you know top, and which suggests uh, apparently the eruptive activity. No, and it gives you a, a, basically a time sequence. You know? And you can see that um, one issue with um, these uh, satellite images is always um, you know the, the cloud and the smoke. It's kind of hard. Uh, for optical sensors to see through smoke and clouds. It's almost impossible, no? Um, and here are some pictures. So I encourage you to uh, visit this site. It contains a lot of information, but not only that, um, in addition to detecting the eruption, the timing of the eruption and following, uh, you know, with the thermal uh, sensor, um, uh, how, uh, you know, uh, the, basically the, 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 the pyroclastic uh, cloud that was, um, you know, um, um, that came out from the volcano and so on. They also used, they also uh, compared that to other satellite measurements that do not necessarily detect the, or image the land surface. These satellite images like Sentinel-5, they actually capture um, information about the atmosphere. So they're not meant to take pictures of the land surface or the earth surface. They're meant to take measurements of the, um, you know, of the atmosphere. And that uh, satellite uh, captured, um, you know, um, uh, the emission of, uh, um, what is it, sulfide oxide. Um, uh, due to this volcanic eruption, no? and it's clearly seen here. And some other pictures and so on. So with this, we oh, still have two minutes. Let me see if I can go back to this one. Okay, remember that the welcome uh, dialog box gives you some examples, and I'm going to go to this um, sulfur dioxide, I'm sorry, sulfur dioxide eruption. And this is sort of a kind of a tutorial. And it shows you what happened on the 19th of February, 2018, and how this eruption is shown on this MODIS uh, picture, right? Um, very different from the clouds. These are clouds and this is obviously you know, what's coming out from the volcano. And then what they did is they monitored it over a couple of days. You know, and you can see clearly that this smoke looks different from the clouds, right? And, and then they compared that with some measurements taken from, the, um, from another satellite that actually detects the sulfur dioxide um, level at the time of the eruption. And the different colors, they show you, you know, uh, how much of it is, uh, you know, and obviously close to the volcano, you see a lot more than uh, further away. And then they compared that with another uh, satellite that uh, measures also sulfur dioxide, but at different levels of the, the topos 
uh, troposphere. So this is the lower troposphere. So white, I think, are very high levels. This is the middle troposphere. And this is the upper troposphere. So this satellite can take measurements along the troposphere at different layers. And if we can relate that with the volcanic activity and you know the timing of the eruption and so on, um, we get a much better understanding of what happens to the plume, the smoke plume, and not only smoke, but uh, you know all the uh, volcanic material that uh, explodes and and, and gets um, uh, dispersed in the in the atmosphere, right? And so they compared four sulfur dioxide layers to see at which level of the vertical column density you know, of the atmosphere, where sulfur dioxide levels were the highest. You know? And so here's the comparison. Okay. And with this, um, I would like to stop and I hope that you will explore this uh, website and use my slides just to uh, learn how to you, uh, use these uh, individual you know, uh, features and, uh, and the timeline. And uh, yep, so I think my time is, uh, is up uh, and uh, I'm, you know, um, I hope uh, you enjoyed it and uh, please let me know if there are any questions. Thank you, Professor Magali. We are really enjoyed it and we already have several questions. Okay, let me stop the so that I can see also the. Um, first of all, I can see the uh, the chat. Yes. Uh, should we start the Q and A session? Yes, please, please. Okay, the first question uh, from Pak Najib. Uh, Earlier, you described about ester that we can use as a soil classification. And can we identify the movement of landslide using the same ester image? Uh, yes, for that, we need a sequence of images. No? And um, the, um, the, uh, the thing with these satellites is that uh, some of them as I said, they take pictures, you know, quite often, maybe every day, like uh, MODIS, the, the one that I was showing you with the volcanic eruption. But the problem is the spatial resolution is very coarse. You know? So although you get a picture every day, but the pixel size is one by one kilometer. So if your landslide is smaller than one by one kilometer, it's hard to measure the movement. Uh, however, what we are seeing more and more, not only with landslides, also with glacial, glacial, you know, uh, uh, movements, is um, uh, we're um, using uh, radar images, you know? and uh, oftentimes um, we're using uh, radar images from uh, several sensors, uh, hoping that uh, they are placed on different orbits, so together they will uh, hopefully um, take pictures more often you know, coming from different satellites. Um, but um, the, uh, the, what's important to know is always the, the size, dimension of the, the phenomenon you are trying to map, the landslide, well, the size, right? Um, whether it's visible on the surface or maybe it's not visible, but the movement can be monitored through uh, processing these uh, radar images, uh, interferometric analysis, that's sort of the term, that measures basically the motion, how the, the terrain is, is changing over time. You know? But um, yeah, you need a time series of images. And um, we are getting closer to having more often uh, uh, images taken, but still, um, it's you know it's not that we get uh, an image every day, for example, from from sensors that can measure the motion 
uh, either landslides or, for example, um, well, glacier uh, uh, movements are very slow. So you don't need so many, um, the, the temporal resolution doesn't have to be so, so high because, uh, you know, uh, you can have much longer intervals. But with landslides, it depends how fast it moves. If it's a slow moving landslide, then yes, you can use uh, radar for that. If it's a short, you know, um, it occurs in a very short period, then you probably, if you're lucky, you find uh, images that were taken, you know, uh, within a few days and you can see that. Okay, thank you for the answer. I hope Anajib uh, is. And the second question come from Mrs. Devina. Uh, volcanic areas are closely related to several potential geological resources, such as gold and geothermal. Uh, is we can use the same image to identify this potential, or we use different between the geothermal and gold resources? Yeah. So for for these, um, you know, um, basically um, um, mineral identification. Um, so you would need to know what would be the surface expression of these minerals, right? If it's gold or, you know, or, or not minerals, or ores, um, because they, you know, they are found usually underground, right? So is there any alteration on the surface that may uh, be used as an indication that a specific ore occurs um, in, you know, uh, in the subsurface? So first of all, you need to know that. Right, and then once you know the um, the alteration uh, minerals on the surface, um, you can map those. Um, uh, the best way to map those uh, is by using very high resolution, uh, very high resolution and uh, uh, spectral resolution uh, images, uh, such as hyperspectral sensors. You no, know? now hyperspectral sensors, and I think I mentioned that uh, in my previous. Uh, slides or previous lectures. Um, right now we have, uh, we have them as airborne systems. So, um, you know, uh, companies that are, you know, exploiting these um, minerals and, uh, and explore them, they use airborne systems, but uh, we should soon have uh, also some satellite hyperspectral uh, data. So yes, so, so, so you would, type on the surface and to look for those signatures using uh, hyperspectral sensors. And uh, the different, uh, yeah. Um, so for different types of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, natural resources, you would need to identify first what, what, on, what type of feature on the surface uh, like when you go out, uh, you know, and, and, and visit the site, what is an indication of, of that natural resource happening in the subsurface? So you need to know the surface expression first. And once you know that, whether it's structures, whether it's uh, weathering, type of weathering, I don't know, then you can go and search for the appropriate uh, satellite uh, image or, or data. So there's no one single satellite that can do everything. Okay, thank you. Uh, the third question comes from Peter. He, he wonder if uh, the geologists, uh, uh, last you mentioned about uh, architecture of archeological, archeological remain in Ethiopia, how to differ between a nature form and the man-made structure? Yeah, so um, field work is always important. <laughs> uh, although with experience, you kind of start learning to differentiate both on the image, but um, you know, remote sensing, 
um, requires either that you go to the field or someone else goes for you to the field and takes pictures. We work a lot with, um, you know, ground photos. I mean, you saw one of my slides showing many pictures, photos from the ground. When we take these ground photos, pictures, we take also a GPS measure. We know where we were standing when we took this picture. That's very important. These are geotagged pictures, very important. And you build um, um, basically a, a database with the geotag pictures. You can do that in a GIS. And then when you look at the images, you can bring this layer and then the, the layer will indicate you where you took some pictures, right? And that will help you interpret features on the satellite image. But yeah, uh, that's why we call linear features linear maps because we don't know whether they are fractures or roads or man-made structures, but we need to uh, identify that first and check that first in the field. So archeologists, they work uh, slightly uh, different way than uh, geologists. First of all, they work uh, in the field, right? <laughs> and then they sometimes, um, you know, ex excavate a little bit and see, you know, they look what's, uh, if they can find some, um, some um, sort of um, uh, remains of uh, human occupation, you know? and, uh, and that lets them then interpret um, basically where settlements occurred and, and how people moved from one place to the other. You know? But they're using GIS uh, a lot now and also remote sensing because they want to know that there's a field called landscape uh, archaeology. It's a, it's a, you know, relatively new, well, not new, but uh, it's a field that has uh, gained a lot of um, importance with, uh, you know, with the, uh, the availability of remote sensing. Okay, thank you, Professor. And the uh, next question is more related uh, to a recent process. Uh, is there any kind of satellite that help us to investigate ground deformation so we can know uh, the magma activity below the volcano? <laughs> yeah, so there's a process in, re in um, radar remote sensing called interferometric analysis, where you basically are using the radar beam um, to measure the distance between the satellite and the um, and um, the Earth surface, no, and so it's basically a, a, a distance measuring, uh, yeah, uh, device if you want, and so uh, and then you take uh, you compare that for um, uh, sort of, you know different time periods, and uh, and the the difference between you know, you you have you take these measurements on time one, and then you compare uh, measurements of the same area for time two, and the difference uh, will indicate um, some motion. And this uh, device or this technology is able to capture uh, motions in centimeter centimeter, uh, you know, uh, levels, and that that of course. Uh, can tell you something about the magma activity of a volcano because before it erupts, you know, usually there it inflates, it may inflate, you know, it may, um, the topography of the volcano may change. Maybe it's not, um, it's only a matter of uh, centimeters, not even meters, but that can be detected. So, and of course, you also look for some uh, you know gases or you know activities uh, occurring in the in the atmosphere, and that's why we have so many sensors just um, observing the composition of the atmosphere. And if you put everything together, so the um, the motion happening before a volcano erupts, and then when it erupts, and so on, and then the composition of the atmosphere, and so on, um, I think you get um, um, you know a more complete picture of how this event is happening. So yes, ground deformation is best um, mapped by using uh, INSAR, interferometric uh, synthetic aperture radar. 
Okay, excellent, thank you. And then from Miss Anis, this is uh, a bit outside the topic, but can we use a satellite image to identify some specific condition in the ocean, such as salinity or carbonate productivity? Yeah, so salinity and carbonate uh, productivity in the oceans can be monitored, can be uh, detected and monitored using satellite uh, uh, images. But um, remember when I was giving you the example of soil moisture, the, the map that I showed you with the soil moisture. So this map uh, is not the direct output of a satellite image, although the, the satellite is called SMAP. I think it's uh, uh, soil moisture. Let me see, let me share my, uh, my screen. One second, where's my screen? Share screen. So it was this one here, no? And um, let me see what the um, satellite, this map, satellite. Uh, soil moisture active passive. And this is the, the, the satellite, right? Um, so this, this satellite actually um, contains several sensors. And, um, and it's not really measuring directly uh, uh, soil moisture. It's uh, taking some readings about um, um, the, the, the moisture content in the soil, but it has to be used together with ground-based um, you know, measurements. It has to be calibrated and it has to be validated. And then it's used in, in a model that basically explains how the moisture content is distributed you know, along the soil column. Uh, and similarly, um, with, um, with uh, uh, your, your, your question, um, so salinity is not something that you can measure from space, but uh, there are some ways of, I think, of uh, knowing the density of the water based on these um, radar measurements. Um, and also the, the temperature of the water can be measured from these uh, sensors. And then using a model that also um, uses some in situ measurements, uh, we can then derive um, salinity uh, levels. And carbonate, I'm not so sure how carbonate uh, can be measured from space. I know that salinity can be measured. Right. Okay, Ms. Anis, that is your answer. And the next question from Yuzap. This is a frequently asked question, I think. Uh, what is the difference about Aster and Landsat 8 for interpretation about lithology? And we know Indonesia is a tropic area. So what is your best advice maybe <laughs> to yeah. deal with this problem? So Aster is um, oftentimes the preferred uh, sensor by geologists because it has 14 bands. And uh, some of the bands are in, um, in the shortwave infrared. And that's a region where the, the soil or the, uh, the lithology has more absorption and reflection features. No? And again, if I can, oh, no, sorry. Uh, what, where is my shared screen? So here, it's pushing the wrong button. If I go to my, um, let me see where I have, um, right, this one here. Again, the soil and, and lithology or rock, uh, the spectral response pattern uh, usually looks similar. In the, in the sense that uh, you got uh, you know a curve here that goes somehow um, uh, you know uh, goes up um, depending on the color of the, uh, the rocks, um, but it doesn't show any peaks or valleys. And in order for us to identify minerals, you know, 
composition, we need to find these peaks or valleys. So here we have a peak, here we have a valley, here we have a plateau, and then the valley and a peak, a valley and a peak. So these, you know, when the curve is not smooth, but it's kind of like this zigzag, uh, that's for us um, uh, a way to I identify the type of uh, mineral or rock composition because these absorption features, they don't happen randomly. They happen a very specific wavelengths. And depending on the mineral, these absorption features will be in a very precise position along the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are looking for. Now, Aster, as you can see here, Aster, Aster only has few bands. But as we move, you see here, these crosses, as we move to um, the shortwave infrared region of the spectrum, it has more bands. And these bands, and they're closely spaced. You see, here they're not closely spaced. Here there's nothing. There's one measurement here and one measurement there and nothing in between. And one measurement here and one measurement there, nothing in between. And it misses this uh, absorption feature. But as we go to this, part of the spectrum, it has more bands. And this is usually a critical uh, region of the spectrum where we can differentiate the different uh, rock types because they tend to have very pronounced um, absorption and reflection features. And this is why Aster is preferred over Landsat because Landsat 8 doesn't have so many bands here, right? So that's basically the, the main reason, except that Aster is a very old sensor and it basically stopped the, the shortwave infrared, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, detectors. They stopped working um, 12 years ago. So uh, we can only use it for older, uh, you know, images. Um, yeah, that were taken um, at least 12 years ago. But for um, lithological mapping, we, we know that uh, you know, it really doesn't matter if you use a, an image from. 15 years ago or, or present day, except that when you have a vegetated area, then it becomes harder. Yeah. Um, so again, maybe the mapping the plants or ma mapping the vegetation and the vegetation types can tell you something about the lithology. There you have to ask a botanist, they know, because certain plants, certain trees, they they like to grow over certain type of soils. And the soil is formed by the parent rock, right? So you start with the vegetation, classifying the vegetation to understand the soil. And when you understand the soil type, you try to figure out what rocks <laughs> contributed to the soil formation. And if you understand that, then you can uh, basically uh, deduct what type of rock might be under the soil. And we had the same problem in, in uh, Ethiopia. There was basically very, very little outcrops, rock outcrops. We had to go to these gullies and these, you know, canyon-like, um, you know, river beds uh, to look for outcrops. I mean, it's, it, because the soil formation is so, so thick and you, you can't see any lineaments, any fractures, it's covered by the soil. So we, we Indirectly, we had to figure out what the lithology is. Okay, thank you for the answer. Uh, we are still have time for <laughs> the Q&A session. So for all the audience, we still, uh, you can still so ask. Yeah, what question uh, do everyone here um, joining us, uh, do they have a copy of the slides or will they have a copy of the slides? Yes, uh, we already share it to them. Oh, yes. okay, okay. Uh, this is my own question. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, in some geological mapping, we use a remote sensing technique to reduce the burden of direct, direct data collecting. Uh, even more so in this uh, circumstances, in this pandemic, so it might be unrelated to the topic, but uh, mm -hmm. from your ongoing research, uh, how does this recent condition affect the data collecting in the field? Uh, is the remote sensing play more important role than usual or? 
Yeah, no, uh, definitely. But, um, you know, um, it's not going to substitute the field work completely. So it, um, it helps if, um, if you have access to uh, pictures, photographs that were taken, you know, uh, on the site, um, even if these are older pictures, you know. But the problem is that the pictures, they photographs, they have to be geotagged. You need to know the coordinates from where they were taken. If you have that access to those pictures, and you know, there's a, uh, this method is used in many disciplines now. It's called uh, crowd crowd sourcing. So we use Google Earth because uh, people they take pictures and then they post it with the in Google Earth or wherever with the um, the geolocation. And if you have these pictures with the geolocation, that will definitely help you in interpreting the, um, the satellite images. But at some point, as I just showed you with Ethiopia, if you don't have any ground photographs and you don't know where they were taking, <laughs> you know, you're guessing it's going to be difficult, no? So uh, crowdsourcing is something used in many disciplines, including, uh, uh, flood events, you know, and now that we have machine learning techniques and so on, I know that um, there are uh, scientists using, uh, you know, when there is a, a flood event, and they they basically search through all the pictures they can find on news, uh, you know, outlets or whoever is taking a picture, and then the the next uh, uh, critical step is to know. <laughs> from, you know, where was this picture taken? Sometimes they look for um, landmarks and they basically reconstruct the position of the photograph uh, uh, from where the photograph was taken. And then they look at what's visible on the photo and try to map that, match that with what the satellite is showing. So you're basically uh, uh, using several scales. So, yeah. Or maybe you have someone who lives close to an area that you're trying to investigate and you ask that person, can you go please <laughs> and take a picture and send it back to me? Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a very good idea. So we can encourage our student to uh, take a picture of the outcrop and then uh, upload it in Google. But but with the geocoding, with the, with the location, yes. very important. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is uh, one more question from Mr. Shauki. If we want to make orthographic image using drone, what kind of software do you suggest? Yeah, yes, I, um, I don't know much about the, the drone software. I know that there are a number of software. Um, usually I rely on, uh, on, on a colleague. Who, who's more knowledgeable than I am. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I suppose, uh, uh, you know, there are many different types of uh, software. I'm, I'm not sure which one is the best one. But drones is another way to cope with <laughs> the coronavirus crisis, you know, um, definitely. And uh, as I said, geocoding, geotag, geotagged uh, drone pictures, geotagged everything. But, you know, not only drone, also simple photographs of an outcrop may help. Okay, thank you. This is all the question, I think. Mm -hmm. So, okay, this is the end of our session uh, for the Q&A. And I will give you some resume to the conclusion in this lecture from Professor Magali. Uh, using remote sensing image, we can see landscape from a wide area to more specific area. Uh, for tectonically active landscape, uh, lineament can be identified using the shade, colors, or pattern, and, and further to be interpreted as Spots or tectonic regime. And then the variety of a volcanic landform make it interesting in satellite image. We can see line, cones, crater, and flow, 
Not only we can associate it with the rocks, but also the process and event of the volcano. And we can use uh, optic images or radar images to identify the landform. Uh, for the example, we can use combination of Iconos and Aster and use uh, for the useful investigation. And lastly, the interpretation of remote sensing must be confirmed by field checking and laboratory analysis so that we can establish a more exact geological interpretation. And then we also have a demo with the website, NASA website, uh, but unfortunately, I try to access it and a bit, a bit hard to reload because my, our connection is poor. So I will definitely come back later. Thank you, Professor Magali. Yes, we can still use some interactive feature from the website. Okay, thank you again, uh, Professor Magali. That is uh, very kind of you to have us tonight and thank you thank you all yeah and next next thursday i think we will meet again in the next lecture okay, okay to con yeah to finish our meeting today i would like to the participant to join us in the picture photo session so you can Turn on your camera. Okay. And I get a chance to see some faces. Yeah. Usually I'm staring at the screen and don't see anybody. <laughs> okay. That's Ms. nice. Nice to Ms. see Ms. you. Ready? Can Ms. you help us to take the picture for us together? Hello, Mas Ready. Okay. Mas Yauki, can you help me? I'm using uh, my handphone. Oh, your phone, yeah. It's okay. Okay. So I'll uh, help you. I will Wait for take a picture. Okay. Okay, I will take the picture. Uh, one, two, yes, three. Smile. Okay, that's good. We have a picture of us tonight. Okay, thank you all for the participant. Uh, we will meet again uh, the next Thursday with Professor Magali with the uh, more interesting topic. Okay, uh, I am Jenny. Uh, say good night to you and see you later. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you, Professor Magali. Thank you. Thank you. Terima kasih Pak Najib, mohon izin. Oh iya, terima kasih Pak Burhan. Ya, Assalamualaikum. Terima kasih dari Pak dari UPN, terima kasih Pak. Waalaikumsalam. Oke, terima kasih Pak. Salam sukses Pak Najib. Dari Pak Miko UPN. Oke, terima kasih Pak. Ya, terima kasih Pak Jatmiko. Iya. Nanti gabung lagi Pak. Kalau ya. ada lagi Pak. Oke, selalu mengikuti kok. Oh ya, siap, makasih. Pamit, Livia. Baik Pak, terima kasih.